great speakers for us. Well, I'm delighted. Jeff, can you lower this one? All right, give him just a second. Um, every year, we try to continue our tradition of getting a speaker. We ask the Buck Institute, can they provide a speaker in early January to kick off the second half of our season? And it's typically well attended, as you see. We're delighted to have so many of you here. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you Edward Anderton. He's a fifth year PhD student at the USC Buck Biology of Aging program. He's in the Lithgow lab at the Buck Institute of Aging in Marin County. Originally from Yorkshire in the United Kingdom, Edward received his integrated bachelor's master's degree in biochem from the University of Oxford. His thesis project focused on neuroscience and evolution of the brain. After graduating from Oxford, Edward worked in project management for the UK's largest retail bank for, five, for three years before returning to his real passion, which is science and solving aging. So I emailed him back and I said, solving aging? Or do you mean solving problems relating to aging? And he said, his mission, his goal is to solve aging. So if he's successful, we may be seeing a future Nobel laureate. <laughs> Edward is particularly interested in how cells perform quality control and how when this quality control goes wrong, it it drives aging phenotypes. When he isn't buried in papers, Edward likes to climb boulders, travel to different countries, and explore the outdoors. And today, Edward's gonna give us an overview of aging biology, ranging from diet and exercise to aging therapies of the near future. Please welcome Edward Anderton. Can you hear me? Okay, here we are. Thank you for that introduction. That was wonderful. Um, yeah, and to, to clarify, when I say solve aging, I really mean solve aging. Um, my, my moonshot goal is to uh, end the aging process if possible. And obviously that's a near impossible goal to achieve most likely, but I think if we can at least get half the way there, then we've solved a lot of big problems in our society. So obviously this is the Buck Institute here. It's an incredibly beautiful campus. I'm incredibly lucky to be here. Um, please come and visit us sometime in the near future. We are gonna be doing tours. I really recommend coming and seeing the beautiful facility there. Okay, so first things first, I have to give a disclaimer because I'm gonna talk about drugs and maybe some supplements when we do our Q&A at the end. Um, and this is not, professional medical advice. This is just me talking about my experience with aging research and trying to give you a, an understanding of that. So please um, always consult with a physician before taking any new medications. Okay, so my talk outline is in three parts. So I'm going to give you an introduction quite briefly to the book, uh, what we do, our mission statement, and this concept of geroscience. So geroscience was coined by my uh, principal investigator at the Book Institute. Um, and it really tries to, to get at the heart of the book's mission. Um, then I'm gonna talk about the science of aging. So it's, as you can imagine, the aging process is incredibly complicated. And so I'm gonna try and simplify this down into what I call my three aging dials. So these are essentially uh, dials maybe that we can use to affect the rate of aging, turn aging down. And then obviously I want to talk about some more interesting um, therapies that might be coming in the pipeline in the next sort of five to 10 years. And then I will finish by just giving you a brief overview of some of the work that I've been doing in the lab on Alzheimer's disease and trying to find small molecules, maybe natural products that maybe we can take to slow down the process of Alzheimer's disease or prevent it in the first place. 
Okay. So yeah, a bit about me. Obviously, she gave a really nice introduction there, but I did my undergrad at Oxford, did my master's there too. And then I was really soul searching at the time. I, I thought that I wanted to be a medical doctor. Um, you know, my parents were very keen for me to go down that path, as a lot of people are. And uh, I think it was actually, I, I went through the process of applying to medical school. And it was really when I was sat there in my, uh, actually, at Oxford interview for the medical program, where I had this out-of-body experience. And I realized this is not what I want to do at all, which I was super lucky because that would have been like a five to 10-year process. <laughs> uh, and, and, and really, I just I, I went back to the drawing board and I said, if, if it's not what I want to do, what do I want to do? And I realized I wanted to have the, the biggest impact possible with, with my life, with my academic life. And I realized it was still in biomedicine. And so um, I was very, very lucky. I found a podcast, which I recommend to everybody if you listen to podcasts, uh, Rhonda Patrick's podcast. Um, it's called Found My Fitness. And she actually interviewed three of the different professors at the Buck Institute, of which one of them is now my lab professor and I thought this this is it I just fell in love with this biology I thought it was incredible and I thought it could have a huge impact so that's I spent some time in a bank um you know that was so, slightly soul destroying <laughs> and and then and then I, I came back to research and so I'm at the Lithgow lab which is situated there at the book institute okay so the book institute's mission the essentials so our mission is to end the threat of age-related disease for this and future generations. So really the book's mission, it's not to solve aging like my moonshot goal. The book's mission really is to end the threat of age-related disease and disability that a lot of people experience with aging. So essentially, how do we grow old without getting all of these diseases? And so this is kind of a picture of medicine in the 20th century, this classical siloed approach to medicine. And so obviously you can see all of these diseases here if somebody gets one of these diseases, typically they will go and see a specific doctor who will specialize in that thing. So for example, Alzheimer's disease, you might go see a neurologist or even somebody who specializes in dementia. Um, you know, obviously the same is true for heart disease and stroke with cardiovascular disease specialists. But one of the key insights that we've had, which people have known this for a very long time, is that really this isn't really healthcare. This is, this is sick care. So this is treating people once they've already got a disease. And often it's the case that people have multiple diseases at the same time because these are occurring with aging. And so our approach really, it, it rests on this idea that aging is actually the number one risk factor for chronic disease. So what, what does all of these things have in common? It's that they don't, they don't tend to happen when people are in their 20s, 30s, even 40s. It's when people reach the latter half of their life that these things occur and actually the, the increase exponentially with aging. So there has to be something going on here. What's happening with the aging process that underlies these? And so really the Book Institute's mission, this idea of geroscience, is that by targeting the aging process itself, we can target the whole array of age-related diseases. And so our goal is to extend the healthy years of life. So as obviously on the left here, this is basically just a diagram which says, all of these different bodily symptom uh, systems, they decline with aging, some faster, some slower. For example, you know, we already know that actually lung function declines very rapidly, even from when someone's in their 30s, which is not great, given that I, I turned 31 last year. <laughs> I can feel it a little bit already. Um, and so the, the future, our, our kind of goal for the future is to, to try and push that process as far to the right hand side of this curve as possible. So uh, what is aging? So as I, I said at the beginning, aging is incredibly complicated. But if I was to try and summarize it, my kind of mental model of understanding the aging process, it's, that it, it's kind of the contribution of two things. So I'll walk you through this. The first is this idea of accumulation of damage here on the left-hand side. So it's kind of represented by this, um, this old beat-up car here, where obviously it's accumulated, it's had wear and tear throughout life, and it's accumulated damage. And actually, on a molecular level, this is this is damage to our DNA. So the code that writes for our proteins in our cells is damaged to the proteins, it's damaged to the lipids, it's damaged to all the macromolecules that make up the cell. And so these get damaged and they increasingly accumulate with aging. And then the other half of this, which I'm not going to talk about too much today, which is a very interesting thing to look into if you're interested, is this idea of loss of coordinated regulation. So what does that mean? It basically means that, you know, when we're young, when we're first developing, 
our bodies are incredibly synchronized. So the, the expression of our genes follows a very, very beautiful sinusoidal pattern with, with the rhythm of the day. And it tends to be the case that this, this pattern becomes, uh, becomes uncoordinated as we get older and older. And so that's a very interesting area of research is how can we basically prevent this loss of coordination that happens with aging. But the thing is the two things interact. And so as you lose coordination, you get more damage. And as you get more damage, you lose coordination. And ultimately this ends with a loss of function. We all experience a loss of function with aging. So understanding these two processes, maybe we can slow it down. So I'm gonna focus on the accumulation of damage and that's just simply because it's easier to study and so there's been a lot more research over the last uh, three decades onto what actually causes accumulation of damage and what processes can kind of ameliorate that. So can the rate of aging be dialed up or down? So as I said at the beginning, I'm going to focus on three aging dials. And it's going to be slightly boring because I'm going to talk about two things that you already know about, but then I'll get to something very, very exciting at the end. So the first aging dial is diet. So we all know that a good diet is part of a pillar of, of good health, but how do we know that diet actually impacts the aging process? So actually the first experiments for this came in the 1930s and actually it wasn't really an experiment. So a lot of science has done this way. It was a bit of an accident. So uh, Clive McKay here was a professor of animal husbandry. I forget now the university, but essentially he was in charge of looking after the health of his rats. So he had a colony of rats, hundreds of rats, and actually he was running out of funding. And so he thought, well, maybe I can just feed them a bit less. So he had half of his rats, he fed them half as much and then the other rats the same. And he saw this really amazing thing, which is the rats that were given the normal diet, maybe I can use this thing, can I point here? Okay, yeah, you can see the curve on the left here is the normal diet. So this is, this is what's called a lifespan curve. So I'm gonna show you one of these later on. So I want you to understand it. So a lifespan curve is basically on the axis on the left, this is the num basically the proportion of animals that are still alive. And then this is time on the, on the x-axis. So this is the number of days those animals have been alive. And as you can see, over time, animals will die and therefore the curve will move down towards zero. And you can see that the ones who are on the normal diet, they were living for, on average, say 50% were living around 550 days. The ones on the food restriction diet, these two curves are both the same thing, two food restriction diet, they were living about a thousand days. So that's about a hundred percent increase in lifespan by eating half as much. Absolutely radical. I mean, if that was in humans, obviously do the maths, that's a 160 year old human. That's absolutely crazy. Now, obviously these things don't necessarily scale. And so we have been looking in uh, larger animals, like for example, in the rhesus macaque. So this is an, a, a non-human primate that's typically used in aging research. And on the left here is the ones that were fed the normal diet. And then on the right is a food restricted diet. In this case, it was a 30% reduction in the number of calories. Now I'm sure you can appreciate just from this image, these are two animals that are chronologically the same age, but the ones on the right here, the restricted diet are clearly in a healthier state. So they have this nice fur coat. They have this, uh, you know, the, they don't have so much of a glazed expression in the eyes that the one on the left does. Uh, and actually the increase in lifespan was not as radical as with the rats, but they did actually increase the lifespan by 12%, which obviously if that was in humans, and this is obviously much closer to human than a rat, that would, that's about eight to 10 years. And the critical thing that they found from these experiments is these animals were healthier. I mean, you can see that the animal on the right is, has more vigor. Um, one, one question, whenever you're looking at these di diet studies is basically how healthy was the normal diet? And so in a lot of these um, animal studies, the diet that they're given is, is sort of an unhealthy diet. So the question always remains like, are you just reducing the amount of unhealthy food or is it the fact that you're reducing food? That's really an open question, but it certainly told us that diet has a very big impact on the aging process. Okay, so can I get a show of hands for anyone who's tried fasting or intermittent fasting? Oh, wow, that's quite a lot. Maybe like 25% of people? So 25% of people have tried intermittent fasting, most likely. So the interesting thing about fasting is it kind of, the, the, the health benefits have been known for, you know, thousands of years. If you look at, you know, ancient Indian culture, they've been doing fasting for thousands of years. But when it comes to the aging research, something that they realized from these studies with rats is that when you restrict the amount of food that they eat, they actually just gobble it all up within about one to two hours. So usually rats, they kind of, and mice, they're very typical. They, they kind of just eat a little bit here and there and they'll eat 
over the entire period that you've given them access to food. And so this diagram on the right, on the left here is basically um, showing the, the, the meal times that happens when you give calorie restriction on a normal diet. So this is a normal day and night cycle. Uh, the, the red bar at the top there indicates that usually animals are given access to food all the time. This is called ad libitum feeding. So the animals can either have access to food all the time or you give access to a, only a small amount of food and they tend to just eat it all within like two hours. So then a big question came from this study is like, hang on a minute. So we give them less food, but they eat all the food only in two hours. So maybe the, all of the benefits that we see is actually just because they're not eating for like 22 hours a day every day. And so there was a very, very elegant uh, study, which I want to share with you, where they tried to get at this question. And this is really the most kind of like sciencey part of the talk. So please stay with me. So they had a few different groups where they could give them either food all the time. This is the, the red bar at the top there. Or they could give them food. They could give them a reduced amount of food for only like a two hour period. But they give, the, give it to them in the day or the night. Similar experiment. But in this group, they give them the same amount of food, but they give small little bits over a 12-hour period, either the day or the night. I think you can see probably where this study is going. Or if you spread out the food over the entire 24 hours, so you give them less food, but you're giving it over the 24-hour period. Now, they found something really crazy here, which is super interesting. So again, we've got a survival curve on the left. So the control animals, the ones who were given ad libitum food, that's the gray line, the furthest on the left there. So they died the soonest. Then they have this second group where if they were given food, and he says here CR day, that means that they were given food during our daytime, but that's actually the equivalent of nighttime because they're, they're actually nocturnal, so they flip. So that's basically the equivalent of humans being given food only in the night. So they live a little bit longer if you reduce the food. That's kind of interesting. But it seems like the fasting time, either 12 hours or 22 hours, makes no difference. They live about the same. But then if they want to get the maximum benefit, the key thing here is what they call aligned timing. So these animals, they're either fasting for 12 hours or 22 hours. didn't seem to make any difference. The key thing is that they were only eating during their active period. So that's super interesting because we know that circadian alignment and everything is important for aging. This shows categorically that the aging rate is determined by not just how much we eat, but when we eat. That's really important. And so not eating at night is probably a very important part of uh, aging healthy. So this was just a summary again, if you, if you didn't catch that, the, the best group essentially was the one that was uh, eating only during its active phase. So how does this relate to humans? There have been some trials with this concept called time-restricted eating. So this is essentially intermittent fasting. So the idea is that you only eat for, say, 10 hours a day rather than 14 hours a day. And they do see a very impressive improvement on a lot of different metabolic uh, features. So this study was people who, they were already people who were kind of overweight and what have you. But they saw a massive improvement in body weight, waist circumference, blood pressure, LDL cholesterol, lots of cardiovascular disease risk factors. So it seems like maybe the process is somewhat conserved. Okay, so what else do we know about diet? So this isn't, I, I, I tend to try and stay away from epidemiological data because it's less clean. You know, as a scientist, you want to be able to test something specifically like in the previous experiment. But there's one thing that comes out of this idea of blue zones. So these are, these are areas of the world where there's actually a, a, an overabundance of older people. <laughs> if that's, that's not very well, good, well phrased. <laughs> overabundance, no, what I mean to say is there's more, there's more of the extremely old people than you would expect. And so these are, there's a place in California, Loma Linda here, and obviously Sardinia and um, Ikeria in Greece and Okinawa in Japan. And so people have tried to look at the lifestyle of the individuals who live there, specifically the diet, and said, what can we take away from that? What's a, what's a sort of blue zones diet, if you will? And so basically, um, they came up with this food guideline. So I'm going to explain what this graph means. So essentially, at the bottom here, we have the typical daily habits of somebody who lives in a blue zone. A really big feature of this is 95 to 100% plant-based on a daily basis. So most of their meals come from plants. It says go wholly whole here, which is, I don't think, a very useful phrasing. But essentially all it means is that a lot of their foods are minimally processed. So they, they're, not eating, they're not eating things from a packet. They tend to always eat a serving of beans. So that just means beans are all legumes. So why is that interesting? That's because it's very, very high in fiber. They drink mostly water, so they're not getting drunk every day. Uh, they do drink coffee and tea, et cetera. 
Uh, and then they tend to snack on healthy things like nuts. Why are nuts healthy? Because, you know, they've got good, healthy oils. And then on a weekly and monthly basis, essentially the message here is they do eat animal protein, but they eat less of it. So they eat fish, tends to be three times a week. They tend to eat eggs, but relatively sparingly. They slash sugar. I mean, it says here, consume only 28 grams per day, which seems like a lot, honestly, for me. I think that's too much even. Uh, and then also they reduce their dairy intake and red meat is basically a, a rarity. So like once a week maximum. So what, well, how do we, how do we distill all this? My, my distillation from this, and actually I do follow a diet that's relatively similar to this, is it's low animal protein. It's low in sugar. It's full of good fats. So we're talking about olive oil. We're talking about omega-3 fish oils. It's high in fiber. Now, this is a really interesting area of aging research. Why is fiber interesting? Fiber is actually the food for our microbiome. So you might have heard this concept that we've got a microbiome on, on and inside our body. What this basically means is that we live in a symbiotic state with fungi, bacteria, even viruses that live just naturally on our skin and inside our gastrointestinal system. Now, actually, it's interesting because if you count the number of cells, the number of bacterial cells, they're much smaller than our cells. The number of cells of bacteria inside our gastrointestinal system is actually greater than the number of human cells in our body. So we're actually more bacteria than we are human. And so this is, this is a whole organism, essentially, a complex organism that's living in and on us. And the fiber that we eat is the primary food for the bacteria, specifically soluble fiber, which can be broken down and, and, and produces metabolites. So we're finding now very, very interesting. There's definitely a link between the amount of fiber that people eat and their healthy lifespan. And second to that, we're finding that actually the bacteria is producing molecules that we're testing in the lab that actually have a positive impact on our body. So you, you feed the bacteria, they produce the protective molecules, and that improves our health span and lifespan. Okay. And then obviously whole foods kind of goes without saying, no processed foods. So what else do we know about the Mediterranean diet? Well, you know what? I was going through this and actually the Mediterranean diet, it's basically the same thing as blue zones in terms of the theory. It's the same thing. Low animal protein, low sugar, good fats, high fiber. Uh, and no processed foods. And so when I try and think about um, sort of distilling diet down into uh, how it impacts aging and how, what we can do about it, I try to think of it in terms of the three R's. So essentially, you can be restricting R, one of three things, two of three things, or all of three things if you go in extreme. It's either what you eat, it's when you eat, or it's how much you eat. And we know that each of these three things has an impact on the aging process. So I'd ask you to just think about what's your location on these axes. Like, are, are, you, are you restricting one or more? Could you be doing more? Okay, two brief caveats. I've kind of talked about the power of diet here. Um, one, the French paradox. So who's heard of the French paradox? Oh, excellent. So this idea is that the French... They eat a lot of cheese, uh, they drink a lot of wine, um, and yet they have reduced cardiovascular disease risk compared to some of their nearest neighbors like the UK. And, and so, you know, this doesn't really fit with the idea of low animal protein, low animal products that you see um, in the blue zones, for example. One thing that has been noted with the French is that it tends to be that they eat smaller portions. So it could be that actually they're just practicing some kind of calorie restriction by comparison with the typical American diet. And then the second thing, this graph's a little bit more complicated, but it's just talking about calorie restriction. So I'm not about to stand here and say everybody should do calorie restriction because calorie restriction is complicated. Most of the animal studies, we use an animal that is inbred. So it has no genetic diversity from its the, the animals that it's living alongside. When we, when we cross animals together and make, make uh, breeds of mice and we do the same experiment, we find that actually some of them live longer, actually by quite a lot. And actually a lot of them, probably about half actually, live shorter. So it's not one size fits all. The effect of calorie restriction depends on the genetics, at least in mice. Um, and we know that obviously one human being to another is way more genetically diverse than most model organisms that we study in the lab. So two, two brief caveats there. So I'm going to try and explain a little bit about 
the biochemistry of what we've learned. So obviously I, you could have gone and probably looked online and found all the stuff that I just told you about healthy diets. What have we done at the book and in the aging field to try and figure out how these might be working and then how can we leverage that to, to sort of find small molecules and other kinds of interventions? So I want you to kind of put your biology hat on from high school or later. Um, this is a cell. This is my representation of a cell. And I'm going to talk to you about insulin signaling and the mTOR pathway. So these are what we call master regulators of the aging process. So essentially what happens is that when a cell is trying to sense its environment, it has these receptors or channels on the surface. These are the blue channels on the surface of the, of the cell here. And so they can be either in, um, they can either be receptors for things like hormones, like insulin, or they can also be channels for letting in uh, molecules that we've eaten, like protein, which gets broken down into branched chain amino acids, and also uh, glucose, which comes from dietary carbohydrates. And so when the cell senses these things, it, it sort of transduces a signal to this master regulator called mTOR. So mTOR has to make a decision. So on a cell-by-cell -cell basis, mTOR makes a decision between what's, can you guys see that? It's kind of blocked up on the side here. So the bottom side here is, do I either grow and divide or do I hunker down and use these protective pathways, which I've said on the left? So how do these protective pathways work? So this is concept on the bottom left here, which is really, really important called autophagy. Now it comes from the Greek auto, which obviously means self, and then phagos, which means eating. So self-eating. So cells have evolved this mechanism, which we've discovered called autophagy, which breaks down unneeded molecules in the cell when there's not enough nutrients in the environment. So you could imagine when there's plenty of nutrients in the environment, when there's enough protein, when insulin levels are high, and when there's a lot of glucose or carbohydrates from the diet, the cell is going to say, okay, I don't need to recycle my machinery. I don't need to do the self-eating process. I'm getting enough from the outside. And so it makes a decision to grow and divide. And obviously, I don't need to explain too much that growing, growth and division is heavily associated with cancer. And also, there are some other pathways which I won't go into, which are essentially called stress response pathways, which, again, it's trying to get the cell to... Uh, to pass through an, a time of need when there's not enough nutrients. So what happens, this is under a high nutrient sensing environment. Essentially, these, these pathways get turned off and the cell will try and grow and divide. Okay, this leads to an accumulation of damage. So how does that work? So essentially, obviously, you know, if we're trying to break down and recycle the, the different molecules inside the cell through autophagy, that's gonna prevent any molecules that have been damaged through just regular metabolism from accumulating. So obviously under a high nutrient levels, we see an increase in the accumulation of damage. And this has been shown in different model organisms. Okay, what happens under a low nutrient environment? So low in nutrient environment means obviously we don't have a lot of branched chain amino acids, which come from dietary protein. And we don't have a lot of glucose in our blood, which obviously comes from dietary carbohydrates. What happens is that this pathway, this mTOR pathway gets closed down, shut off. mTOR doesn't work anymore. And the process actually leads to an increase in autophagy and a reduction in the accumulation of damage. So to summarize this, we know that essentially the nutrients from our diet are impacting this central aging pathway, which affects the accumulation of damage, one of the main drivers of the aging process. So autophagy there I've highlighted is incredibly interesting and important. There's a lot of very interesting YouTube videos on that. I would recommend checking it out. Okay. So I'm going to move on to the second aging dial, and I'll relate this back to what we've learned about the biochemistry in a minute. Okay, and so the second aging dial is exercise. Now, we all know that exercise is part of healthy living. Um, I really cannot stress enough, and I'm really happy to be co-sponsored by the fitness center, the, the importance of exercise. Now, if there was a drug that could mimic the effects of exercise, it would be the trillion dollar drug, right? It, would, it, it does everything. Exercise does everything. It's good for our brain. It's good for our cardiovascular system. It's good for our muscles. Now, what do we know about the relationship between brain aging, muscle strength and fitness and uh, aerobic fitness and just aging process and diseases? So obviously it goes without saying that if you have stronger muscles, you're way less likely to be disabled. So to gain to, a disability is directly correlated with the, the mass of our muscles. So stronger, bigger muscles, less disability. That's obvious. One very, very interesting finding, which we don't quite know why this is the case. 
aerobic fitness, as measured by something called VO2 max, which is essentially the amount of oxygen that we can take from the environment and use for energy, is probably the strongest correlation with lifespan in human beings. So it's incredibly important that we maintain aerobic fitness with aging. It's the biggest predictor of all-cause mortality that we have. And then when it comes to cognitive aging, I, I actually, I've tended to sort of um, ignore this fact, but it's a really big part of exercise, I think, is the ability to kind of coordinate our bodies. And so dancing is probably the best example of this. It's probably the best kind of exercise that you can do. I can't stress that enough because it involves all three of these things. Um, but very importantly, it's about coordination and balance. So we're training our, neur uh, our, our neurons in our brain to kind of sense the environment. Something that's emerging in the Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease field is this idea of cognitive reserve. Um, the idea is essentially that the more cognitive capacity that we have, then the more we have to lose in a sense. And so we're kind of bolstering our, our cognitive capacity. And a really big part of this actually is how exercise and specifically things like dancing and coordination interact with a part of our brain called the substantia nigra. So this is part of the brain that gets damaged in Parkinson's disease. It seems like people who have a, a high... Uh, kinesthetic cognitive re uh, reserve uh, protected from Parkinson's disease. And it actually does slow the Parkinson's disease progression too. So very, very interesting. If we could package all this into a drug, we'd be off to the races. So how does exercise actually relate to some of these pathways I talked about before? So actually, it, exercise is a very, very potent activator of the autophagy process. So it's, as, so it's actually as effective as starvation uh, upregulating autophagy. So if you're not very interested in doing this calorie restriction thing, get to the gym. <laughs> there's, there's also another player in this process called AMPK. And, and AMPK is very, very interesting because there are some small molecules, one of which I'll talk about later on, which works specifically through interacting with AMPK. And exercise is a potent activator of the AMPK. So AMPK, you don't need to know what it stands for, but essentially it's a, it's a protein inside the cells that turns off mTOR and obviously upregulates this process. So this is, this is a key kind of aging pathway going through AMPK. Okay, so the third aging dial is this thing called senescent or zombie cells. So um, actually another show of hands, has anybody heard of senescent cells before? There's a spattering of people. Oh, great. Because actually the last talk I went to, it was like <laughs> huge, like everyone knew about it. I couldn't believe it. So this is, this is a very, very exciting and new area of aging research. So to kind of understand what senescent cells are, we really need to understand that it's a consequence of too much damage inside the cell. So obviously I talked about this idea of uh, accumulation of damage being a driver of aging. That's actually because ultimately it leads to one of three things that either leads to cell death, um, senescent cells, which I'll talk about in a moment, or obviously cancer cells, which can be, a, which can be a, a consequence of too much growth and division. So what is a zombie cell? So essentially it goes in three steps. You have this trigger event, which is at the top there, so which is damage. So damage can be damaged macromolecules inside the cell, like DNA damage, for example. And this triggers a process where these cells, they stop dividing and they start spitting out these signals. So this is a normal part of wound healing, actually. So if you cut your arm and you get all, you know, obviously it goes red and everything, you get the inflammation there. That's because when you cut your arm, you damage the cells. The cells begin to secrete these inflammatory molecules, which bring in the immune cells and clear everything away. So it's a normal part of, of just biological function. Unfortunately, with aging, it seems to be the case that when the immune cells come to clear away these senescent cells, they fail. So they, they either don't recognize them or they've lost the ability to accurately clean them away. And so what happens is it accumulates and you get this here, it says a clear or clog function. So the immune system either comes in and clears away senescent cells or they accumulate and they begin to uh, cause tissue fibrosis. And so really this, this is a kind of summary of um, what happens with aging is that we accumulate these senescent cells here, which are shown in a sort of blue purple color. And the idea really is, obviously, senescent cells, I should, I should mention, actually, is that they have a broader impact on the body. So senescent cells, obviously, they, they're not good for the tissue that they reside in, but they actually cause broadly information in the body. So they're secreting these molecules, they're not getting cleared away, and so the body's becoming more and more inflamed. And unfortunately, one of the consequences of that is that it stops stem cells from being able to function. So you've probably all heard of stem cells. 
stem cells are really important for regenerating tissues, including even in the brain. And so what they found is that the inflammation caused by senescent cells prevents the stem cells from working properly. And so you could imagine that actually a senotherapeutic, which actually just means as something that's working to sort of mitigate the problems of senescent cells might be might work by bringing down inflammation, might cause stem cells to work better and slow down the aging process. Now, this is probably one of the most dramatic pictures I could show you, and I love showing this to people because it, it's the kind of thing that gets people excited about aging research. So these mice are actually the same age. They're actually quite old. They're probably... Um, two and a half years old, which is quite old for a mouse, they'll start to die around two and a half to three years. Um, the one on the left is the brother of the one on the right. They're actually genetically, they're clones, they're identical. But the difference is that one of them was fed a small molecule or a cocktail of small molecules that got rid of zombie cells. And obviously that's the one on the right. So these animals live about 35% longer. It's a modest increase in lifespan, but as you can tell, they look like a young mouse. It's really impressive, the effect of removing these senescent cells. So it kind of gets at that idea of increasing healthy lifespan. Okay, so do we have drugs to treat aging? Now, the answer is definitely yes. We have drugs that treat aging in mice. <laughs> One of those drugs, though, is interesting because it's already something that gets given to humans. This is a drug called metformin. So Maybe some people in this room have actually been prescribed metformin. Metformin is an anti-diabetic. Uh, it's a diabetic medication. It's, a, it's, it's to control blood sugar. But it's interesting that actually we found, in, if you give this to mice, they, they live longer and they're healthier. Um, and actually epidemiological data, which you know, I'm not a massive fan of, but which is definitely suggestive, suggests that people who take metformin, who are typically diabetic, actually do better than people their age who are not diabetic, who are not on metformin which is strange because we know diabetes itself has an impact on the aging process. So there's a very interesting trial that's going on right now, spearheaded by Nia Barzilai, um, who's one of the leading researchers in aging, called the Targeting Aging with Metformin Trial, or the TAME trial. So this is a multi-site trial that's happening across the United States. If you search this, um, I'm not sure if they have a center nearby, but they are looking to enroll people, I think, still. Um, and the idea is what they're going to do is they're going to take people who are already exhibiting signs of aging. So people who are in their um, old, older than the age of 65, but have already contracted or developed, sorry, an age-related condition. So that could be anything from um, some level of cardiovascular disease, maybe they've developed diabetes even. And they're asking the question, what happens if we give metformin? Does it slow down the process of aging as measured by the development of the next age-related disease? Because we know these diseases come on and they develop in an exponential fashion. So that's going to be very interesting. That's going to be going in the next few years. And we'll know within, I think the power of the studies within five to 10 years, they'll know for certain if it's actually having an impact on the aging process. And obviously they're going to be measuring a bunch of different things alongside this. They're going to be measuring these new things called aging clocks, which we can talk about in the Q&A at the end, if you're interested. So another thing which I'm particularly interested about, I think this is an incredible molecule, is this thing called rapamycin. So also a show of hands, has anybody heard of rapamycin? There's a few people again, like super engaged people at the back there. Just, yes, I know more. Yeah, so rapamycin is very, very interesting. So rapamycin is actually an antifungal medication that was discovered on the island of Rapa Nui, which is why it has this name, rapamycin. And the, this molecule in the middle I talked about, mTOR, gets its name from rapamycin. It actually means mammalian target of rapamycin. So it, we discovered this molecule because we realized that when we give rapamycin to cells, it, it slows the growth and division down. And that's how they discovered this mTOR uh, central regulator of the aging process. So we have a drug that we know is very specific inhibitor of this central aging um, pathway. And this has been replicated, the, the, the effect of this on lifespan has been replicated across many different studies in mice. Um, I don't believe that it's been given to rhesus macaques yet, or we don't have that data yet. But one thing is absolutely certain, it works in mice across different genetic backgrounds. So that's really important because it's something that probably will work in humans too. So there was actually a trial recently um, into rapamycin. Have I got this on the next slide? Well, it's not technically rapamycin because obviously drug companies don't care about molecules that are now off patent. So they tried to make a better version of rapamycin, which is a little bit more specific called a rapalog, so that then they could market this uh, as an anti-aging compound. 
What was interesting about this study is they gave this rapalog to older individuals. And this was actually during, this is a, a weird study because it actually happened right at the crossover between pre-pandemic and pandemic time. So they were testing immune function in people given this rapalog. And they were measuring at the time the incidence of respiratory infection. And so initially they were thinking that they, they did a small trial and they looked at um, how much flu people got basically. And they found that there was a significant reduction in the proportion of people who developed flu over the winter period after taking one of these rapalogs, which is very, very exciting. So then they went into a phase three clinical trial, but obviously very, very bad timing. COVID hit, it had, you know, all kinds of, oh, was it COVID? Was it not? You know, people, everyone was reporting symptoms. Oh, I had something. I didn't have something. So it completely muddied the data. But then very, very recently, I heard the, the leader of this trial talking about some interesting COVID data that they had. Where actually, they found that people who were on the Rapalog, even though they were stopped taking the Rapalog, some months down the line seemed to be getting less COVID, which is super interesting because it suggests that maybe there was some reversal of immune aging that was mediated by a short-term treatment with the Rapalog. So very, very interesting. And there's going to be trials, I think they're ongoing even already, into Parkinson's disease, Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease and other age-related diseases. So definitely one to watch out for. And then senolytics. So what does senolytic mean? So senolytics are senescent cell killing drugs. It's really obvious that for those zombie cells having such an important impact on aging, we want to get rid of them. And so Judy Campisi, who is one of the faculty at the Book Institute, she started a company with a few other people called Unity Biotechnology. And they're basically looking at treating age-related diseases using senolytics. So they're making novel drugs, which can kill senescent cells. And so they've had a couple of clinical trials in humans. One of the clinical trials actually was in osteoarthritis of the knee, which initially had some good results. But unfortunately, it turns out that is a very, very hard thing to treat, especially when you're looking at pain. So it turns out that when you treat people for osteoarthritis, you can actually give them a sham surgery and they report being miraculously better. So it's a very placebo-driven kind of uh, kind of study. And so unfortunately, they didn't see significant um, effects there. But very hot off the press, this was only in the last few weeks, they've been treating um, a form of age-related um, blindness, basically. And they've had some, some profound success with that. So they've been injecting this molecule into the eyes for people who've got this um, disease. And they see a sort of reversal of disease. Very, very interesting. Just to remind you, that's what we're aiming for. So how do we how do we deal with aging? So if we can we can stop this accumulation of damage, if we can make sure that the loss of coordinated regulation is is dealt with and we keep everything pristine, then hopefully we we stave off the loss of function. And this is what we're gonna look like. We're gonna look like this beautiful car on the left. <laughs> okay. So I'm just gonna briefly talk about some research that I've been doing in the lab. Um, and this is around this concept of protein aggregation in aging and Alzheimer's disease. So obviously everybody's heard of Alzheimer's disease, but I want to kind of give a breakdown of what is what do I mean by protein aggregation and why is that important for the disease? So to kind of think about that, I want to kind of get you all to think about uh, like a user manual. So this is a user manual for a bike. Inside there, it has information for all of the different parts that make the bike and the specific shapes that make up the wheel, you know, the spokes, et cetera. And so really, that's kind of a good analogy to try and think about what DNA is to the proteins in our cell. So DNA is kind of the instructions in the instruction manual, and that gives rise to the very specific proteins that make up our cell. And they have a very, very specific shape, and that's super important. But unfortunately, the, as biology happens, um, as, the, as the proteins are being made, they, they initially start life as this unfolded kind of string-like structure. And they have to then fold into this very beautiful helical structure or more complicated things like the one on the top left there. And that happens by a series of very complicated and uh, elegant um, mechanisms, but unfortunately it is fraught with danger. So along the path from an unfolded protein to a folded protein, there are several misfolded, like aberrantly folded states. And so this is kind of an idea here. So rather than having the, the circular wheel, you end up with a square wheel, which really can't do anything. Um, and then unfortunately, if that persists, which unfortunately we think these misfolded proteins do persist with aging, they form something called the protein aggregate, which is basically where they all clump together. And unfortunately, protein aggregates have been associated with senescent zombie cells, 
chronic inflammation and just systemic aging of the whole body and with Alzheimer's disease. Now, one very interesting thing is that we know that autophagy will clear away protein aggregates. So again, linking to the two pathways that I told you about earlier. Okay, so how does this relate to Alzheimer's disease? So some of you might already be aware that Alzheimer's disease is characterized by the formation of these amyloid plaques in the brain. So if we take a post-mortem look at somebody who has Alzheimer's, who had Alzheimer's disease before they died, you'll see that the brain has atrophied. This means that the neurons that make up the brain have died. And so you see a lot of the ventricular spaces increase around the brain. And you'll see these very characteristic plaques for this protein called amyloid beta. So amyloid beta is one of these unfortunate examples in biology where it really likes to misfold. So this is a protein that has a normal function in our, in our body, but unfortunately it will misfold very easily. And we see that this actually does increase with aging. So one of the questions in the Lithgow lab we had was, can we discover small molecules, natural products, drugs that might protect against the toxic effects of amyloid beta in an Alzheimer's disease situation? And so to study this, now this, this is a real left field. So we, we actually use a, a very, very interesting molecule, um, molecule organism called uh, the C. elegans. So this is a microscopic worm. You think, why do we study a worm? The reason is because this worm actually, for all of its difference from humans, still shares 65% of the DNA. It still has the same aging pathways, mTOR, AMPK, I told you about earlier. And it has much of the same tissues that we do, although morphologically different, obviously. They have a very primitive brain, so they, have a, they do experience neurodegeneration as they age. They have skin, intestines, muscles, and they have uh, a very developed um, gastrointestinal system there, which does have leaky gut, which is what, something we see with aging in, in humans. And that's what they look like under the, under the microscope. So they're very easy to study, and they're especially to, easy to study when it comes to aging because they only live two weeks, which means you can screen small molecules and things like that very easily. So why do we use it to study Alzheimer's disease? Well, it's simply because you know, we, we can engineer these worms so they express the human protein. So it's expressing it in a living organism inside the muscle, and we can see what the effect is, and we can see if maybe we can find molecules that can help with that. So what I'm showing here is this is a genetically modified C. elegans, which has amyloid beta taken from human DNA um, expressed in the, in the muscle. And at 20 degrees, just kind of a normal, happy growing temperature for worms, they're wriggling around, having a nice time, eating food. At 25 degrees, only a modest increase, there's actually a lot more of this amyloid produced and it starts to aggregate. So we can see that these aggregates form similar to what happens in humans. And actually the worms very rapidly will paralyze. So obviously this becomes a very nice system whereby you can give them a small molecule and see whether or not you can rescue back to the happy worms. And so I'm just gonna show you a, a few graphs which indicate a few hits that we've got and I'll explain why I think the mechanisms are pretty interesting. So the first is thioflavin T, which is on the left-hand side here. So let me just explain these graphs so you understand where we are. So the black line is the level of paralysis, which is the, the percentage of the worms that are paralyzed under the control condition. So they weren't given a drug. And then obviously next to that, the gray bar shows the, the level of paralysis when they were given the drug. So thioflavin T is interesting because thioflavin T actually we know directly binds to amyloid beta. Now, it's not something that we're going to give to humans because it's actually a dye that's used in, in clothes and things like that. So it's definitely not something that's healthy per se, but it has a very profound impact on how amyloids stick together and obviously proves that you can prevent paralysis. And so then these are four molecules. They're all very interesting for different reasons, um, which seem to show a reproducible reduction in the amount of paralysis. So it seems to protect against the toxicity that you see. So going from left to right here, Alpha ketoglutarate, so we, it's sometimes called AKG. Now, you can buy this as a supplement. I'm not recommending that you do that, but it's produced by the body, and so it's, a, it's an endogenous metabolite, and so it's probably not dangerous, uh, and it does seem to show a modest reduction in the level of paralysis, and I'll come on to talk about that a little bit more in a minute. And then we have these other molecules here, resveratrol. So resveratrol is um, interesting because it's found in red wine, and we all like red wine, especially in wine country, are we? Um, a carbos is interesting because it's an anti-diabetic drug, which is exceedingly safe in humans um, and seems to have some impact on lifespan. And then this molecule here on the right, which is actually my favorite anti-aging molecule, which is called urolithin A. Now, urolithin A is not something that our bodies produce. Uh, not Our human cells do not produce it, but our bodies produce it. And that's because the gut microbiome produces urolithin A in response to things that we eat from our diet specifically things like pomegranates. So pomegranates are exceedingly healthy because 
they, they lead the gut microbiome to produce urolithin A. Now, urolithin A has very profound impact on many different aging phenotypes, and this is just one of them that I'm showing here. And it has been shown in previous studies, not by my hands, that all four of these molecules on the right side do seem to work to a certain extent by impacting calorie restriction pathways, exercise pathways, the things that I showed you earlier on in the, in the talk. So our lab actually took AKG a little bit further and gave it to mice. And so here you can see these are chronologically the same age mice. And on the right hand side, they were given a regular chow diet. And on the left, they were given a chow diet supplemented with AKG. And obviously you can see there's a profound impact on uh, graying and um, balding, which happens with aging. Now I'm not showing the data here, but they tested about 30, I think, 30 different frailty measures. So this is like grip strength, um, cognitive functions and all that. And I don't think there was a single measure that wasn't improved by AKG. So that's pretty profound. And obviously increase the lifespan too. We published this in 2020 in Cell. It was a big paper. Okay. So how do you learn more about aging and keep up with the book? I would recommend that you check out our website. We have many different things on the website that are of interest. We have a blog, which is written by students and postdocs, which is incredibly brilliant. Um, and we have... <laughs> Yeah, okay, I'm a little biased. Um, and then obviously you can follow us on Twitter, um, LinkedIn, Instagram. And I want to do a plug for my professor's new podcast. So this is called, uh, we're not getting any younger yet. Um, this is uh, Gordon Lithgow, my PI. He just started this podcast. I think we're on episode five now. It's a really exceptional way of, uh, as a layperson, getting to know a broad uh, range of aging uh, ideas. Um, and it's definitely pitched, it's pitched at a lay audience. I would recommend that. And in fact, I, I enjoy it too, because Gordon's from Glasgow. So he has a delightful Scottish brogue, which is just nice to listen to. Uh, you can find that on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. And then obviously once we're reopened, please come and visit. So we do usually schedule tours. If you keep checking the website, they will be telling uh, about tours uh, on there. Um, and the, the building itself was actually designed by I.M. Pei. So it's, it's a really beautiful piece of architecture, which even if you don't speak to many scientists, it's gorgeous to walk around. Obviously, it's best in the, the hills of Marin. You get this beautiful view of Novato below. Okay. Uh, and then, obviously, we do also take uh, donations. We have a, a philanthropy is actually a very big part of the book's um, budget. Um, obviously, we get funded mostly by the NIH and the NIA, the National Institute of Aging, but we also take philanthropic donations, and we have a whole system that you can get involved with if you're interested in learning more about the book and donate, and you can, you can find that on the website. Happy to talk to you about that at the end as well. Okay, so thanks for listening. Um, that's a broad view of aging, I hope, but I really want to answer a lot of questions, supplements, anything that you're interested in. Thanks for listening. Great. If you all wait for the microphone. Outstanding. Thank you, Edward. Lynn um, and I will be going back and forth for the questions. We'll start here, and then Lynn, you'll have the second question. Uh huh. Let me just say that that microphone that Ginny is bringing around, you hold it a little bit farther away, uh, no, closer, closer, and mine a little bit farther away. I don't know why they're different, but they are. Could you, you talk about the role of inflammation in aging? Mm. That's a really good question because. It's, so there's this concept in aging called inflammaging, which basically summarizes this idea that actually a lot of aging is driven by, by inflammation. Um, it's, you know, a lot of this is, a lot of the data that we have around that is based on animal models. Um, and so, you know, a lot of the, uh, basically everything I've said today, a lot of it's based on animal models. So I will caveat everything I say with, we don't know as much about human aging but it definitely seems to play a role in, in many different diseases of aging. Like it's, it's usually a central part of the aging process. So what's causing that? Um, it seems to be the case that senescent cells might be driving that process. But again, we don't quite know with humans because we haven't done the study yet. Um, but definitely it's the case that um, inflammatory cytokines, so these are signaling molecules that are made under normal processes, seem to increase with aging uh, in a sort of chronic and low grade sense. And so anything that can kind of bring down that process is probably going to be good for aging. Um, exercise is, has a profound impact on that. And I think the reason is because exercise causes acute inflammation, which then allows the body to sort of resolve that, uh, that process. So exercise is probably the most impactful with regards to that.
and I get to ask the first question for this side of the room. Is there a blood test to detect zombie cells or how are they determined? How are they detected? Such a good, such a good question. Such, that's something that they're trying to do right now. They're trying to figure out, can we find, because you know, obviously you could take a, a biopsy of tissue and then you can measure it. So we, one of the reasons why we're quite confident about senescent cells is because you can take a skin biopsy from people of different ages and you can see there's an accumulation of those cells there. So that's something that we can just look at under a microscope and see with a certain staining. But that's obviously done ex vivo, so that we don't do that in people. A blood test would be ideal because, you know, that'd be way easier to measure. Also, we can measure, um, you know, you take a molecule and we see down the line, does that actually improve it? So there is a guy, um, he used to be at the book. He was a postdoc there. Now he's got his own lab, I forget now, on the East Coast called Chris Wiley. And he did find that there is a, there is a small molecule that's produced by senescent cells, which may be we can use as a biomarker, but that's not going to be something that's available for human testing for probably like five, 10 years whilst we validate that. But so to answer your question, perhaps a skin biopsy is the way that people will go in the short term. But I think that, you know, senolytics haven't been tested in humans yet. And so it's probably a ways off from finding out whether or not that actually works for aging. Thank you. Yep. <clears throat> Hi, hello. Hi. I really like the analogy of the dials on aging. And um, what do you think of the idea that there might be more of a psychological or social dial to aging? I've been reading a book called Breaking the Aging Code. Mm. And this um, professor, I think out of Yale, has this um, book that explains various studies show that people who have ingrained or live amongst cultural stereotypes about aging that are positive, mm. people mm. in those societies tend to live mm. on average seven and a half years longer. Right. So how does that fit into the budget yeah, to I mean, consideration of, yeah. of aging and prolonging yeah. healthy living. I would say that the, the book's main focus has been on sort of the, the, the biochemical and less of the sort of psychological, but that's something that people are talking about more. I was recently at a conference in San Francisco called BAM. I recommend anybody to go to that if you're, if you're around. Anybody can attend. It's free. Um, it's a Bay Area aging meeting. So they're, they have multiple. They move around between Burke and Stanford and uh, UCSF and Berkeley. Um, and again, that was one of the big themes, actually, that people were talking about in the panel at the end there. But it was there was a lot of unknowns because it's, I mean, one, how do you test that in model organisms? That's very difficult. And two, the epidemiology, it's very hard to control for other factors because if you're living in a community that has that kind of attitude, then does that mean that you're also having a positive attitude about exercise and diet and sleep and everything? So I would, I would kind of caution that we, we don't really know yet. Um, but it just seems to be the case that, you know, stress maybe is associated with a faster aging, um, childhood trauma as well. There was a relationship found there with um, accelerated aging phenotypes. But again, it's hard to control for sort of environmental factors. So perhaps this is kind of a recap question, but if your dad came to you right now and said, Edward, I think I could probably improve my lifestyle. What would you recommend to him? And realize we're not, yeah. not a doctor. You know. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, with the caveats, the necessary caveats. We actually did have this conversation recently because <laughs> he came to me and he was like, so I had my blood pressure done. And like, is, is 160 bad? And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> uh, yeah. So we, we talked about that. I mean, the main thing was um, getting him moving. <laughs> Because he, he was exercising, you know, he liked to walk his dogs and go hiking and everything, but he, was he really doing, uh, was he really stretching his aer aerobic capacity? So was he getting on a bike or even just fast walking on a treadmill, you know, to, to just get the get sweat and get everything moving? And um, I will say that anecdotally, you know, N of one, he started it only about a month ago now, and he said his energy levels are just through the roof on an evening. He's He's not slouching around and watching TV as much anymore. He's like getting up and doing stuff. So exercise is like, undeniably the, the best thing that you can do. And I think, I think one of the things that maybe people get a little confused about with exercise is that, because uh, there's, there's so many different modalities, right? Like it's lifting weights, it's like elliptical or, and I think honestly, they're all good. They're all good and they actually, they're not as distinct as we think. Because when they've looked at how, do, how does like metabolites in the blood change when you do aerobic exercise versus lifting weights? And the answer is that it's like 85% the same. So probably on a sort of system-wide level, you know, if you're not somebody who can get out and run anymore or even get on the bike, then lifting weights might be, might be your way. And it's not like you have to lift 
you know, you don't have to be like Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, to, to really get the benefits. I think you can, you know, you can do a high, high rep, low weight exercise, and that will give you the same benefits as doing, you know, high weight, low rep exercise. So exercise is like absolutely the best thing that you can do. Um, in terms of supplements, I would say I actually, I actually tend to be very conservative when it comes to supplements because um, like, for example, you might have heard of NAD boosters. That's a, something that's very, very commonly talked about now, NAD boosters. So what, what's an NAD booster? So this all comes from research in where we found that with aging, the levels of a molecule called NAD goes down in the blood. Okay, so that lots of things go down with aging. Why is that interesting? Well, NAD is thought to be like a central molecule for how our bodies turn food into energy. And so obviously if that's going down, then you know a simple question would be, is that why we have less energy as we get older? Well, in this is also true in mice. So in mice, the NAD levels go down and you can give them molecules that will bring the NAD levels up and they do live healthier and it does increase lifespan in some studies. But when they've looked at this more rigorously with like different genetic backgrounds, it didn't replicate. So we weren't able to see a lifespan effect, which makes me think that if you don't see something that's increasing lifespan, it's very hard to prove that that's actually hitting the aging process in a meaningful way. Like it could be working through something else. So any, okay, all of that to say NAD boosters, there's, there's not a huge amount of data in mice that is going to work for aging. And in humans, there's virtually no data. All we know is that we can give these NAD boosters and it increases NAD. We have no idea what the effect of that is going to be on people's health. We just don't know. And so you can, you know, you can go to Amazon and you can buy like high doses of these NAD boosters right now. But I would definitely recommend against doing that whilst we get some real human, human data. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess my answer is like exercise above all else would be, would be my answer. Yeah. How did the morpho hi, how did the morphological changes in mitochondria relate to the material you presented? Okay, yeah. And are those changes a cause or an effect of aging? Yeah, that's a really good question. So the question was for anybody who didn't hear it, how do morphological changes, so changes in the shape and structure of mitochondria impact aging essentially? Are they causal or just correlated? And so I didn't really talk about mitochondria because it's, you know, there's so many aspects that I could have talked about, but mitochondria are essentially the, we call them the powerhouse of the cell. Now they do more than that, but they are the primary energy production unit in our cell. It's a very interesting part of the cell. It's called an organelle, which just basically means it's like a, it's like an organ within the, the, the body of the cell. And uh, the <laughs> mitochondria were actually originated as bacteria, like billions of years ago. And they were engulfed by our cells and then co-opted into a symbiotic relationship. And so we have these mitochondria in the cell and they have their own genome, actually. They have a small amount of DNA because they, they originated from a prokaryote in, the, in our history. And what we found with aging is that the number of, as we measure it, the number of mitochondria seems to go down in certain tissues. Um, there's tissues, tissues that you can think of as being particularly impacted by mitochondria are muscles, because obviously you need a lot of energy there heart, it's a type of muscle, and obviously the brain. So the brain is like incredibly energy intensive and has like a very complex mitochondrial structure. And what happens with aging is like the number of mitochondria as measured by the number of these DNA molecules goes down. And we don't really know if that's causal or correlated exactly, but it's definitely suggestive. And the structure of the mitochondrial network changes radically. So when we're young, the mitochondrial network is we call it tubular, which just means it's kind of connected. Like if you were to see a, a picture of it, it would look like a highway of connected mitochondria. And what happens with aging is they become fragmented. And so that, I think that's probably what the gentleman was referring to about the morpho morphological changes. So the mitochondria become fragmented with aging. And so it's interesting. It's correlated with certain interventions. Like I showed you an intervention there called urolithin A, which is my most, I'm my most excited about that molecule. That impacts a process called mitophagy, which basically comes from autophagy and mitochondria together. So mitochondria, autophagy, mitophagy. What that means is as mitochondria become damaged, they can be, they can be uh, repaired or cleared away by mitophagy, a specific form of autophagy that clears them away. So we have certain small molecules where if we give them, we know it increases mitophagy. The mitochondria return from being this kind of uh, broken up fragmented structure into a more tubular structure and the animals tend to be healthier. 
Now, does that mean does that mean that it's causal? I mean, it's suggestive. It's suggestive. But that's just in model organisms, and we don't we don't have any idea in human aging yet. So it really we really don't know. But I'm definitely very excited about that. You mentioned uh, the restriction of sugar is important. Yeah. Are we kidding ourselves when we uh, fall prey to sugar substitutes or uh, mm. artificial sugar like monk fr fruit, which is, of course, natural? Right, right. What is the correlation between sugar and sugar substitutes? Right. So, so you've probably heard of um, the research where they've tried to associate things like... Um, like asulfame and these other like sweeteners that you'll find in like Coke Zero and stuff like that. You, there have been studies where they've tried to associate that with cancer and things like that in in animal models. And my my reading of that literature actually is that they tend to give it an incredibly high amount, many many orders of magnitude higher than you would ever drink. You, you'd have to probably drink like. 20 gallons of Coke Zero to get that amount of ace sulfame or whatever the, the name of the molecule is. And so I would caution anybody who thinks that stevia or these other things um, could be as bad as sugar. We, we know that sugar and carbohydrates, glucose, is, dr is driving the aging process. Like there's, there isn't an animal model where you feed them a lot of sugar. They don't get, they get sick. They always get sick. They have increased adiposity, they, they're obese, they lose cognitive function. I think we're pretty confident that through the insulin pathway and what I've shown you here, glucose is, is driving aging to a certain extent. And I, I haven't seen any data to suggest that like stevia or monk fruit or anything like that is driving aging. Um, obviously, it goes without saying that if there's a new molecule that comes out that's like the new, you know, like chemically derived sweetener we should take that with we should take we should be cautious about it but i i think i don't think i've seen anything that that proves that they're actually bad for health um, and if it means the difference between having that and sugar then i think it's a bit of a no-brainer actually yeah what are, what are you working on right now that you're most excited about being able to help solve our aging okay um well it's hard for me to say that because i'm i'm not working in one of necessarily one of these like really you know forefront areas i'm actually working on like basic aging biology so m i haven't showed it here but i'll tell you about my my research that i think is quite interesting so one of the questions is and i, I mentioned this multiple times and you probably got this theme we got a lot of information from animal models. Like we know a lot about how a mouse ages, but we really don't know that much about how humans age. And you can you can plot a graph of the size of an animal with like how long it should live. And there's a linear relationship there, like a log linear relationship between the size of the animal and the maximum lifespan. You've probably heard that the maximum lifespan, so the oldest living, the oldest human we've ever known, was 122 years. That's crazy. I mean, like humans really humans for our size should not live that long. Like we, we are the exception to the rule when it comes to that, that graph. And there are some other organisms that are interesting that have a similar thing. Like you might've heard of naked mole rats. They're only the size of a mouse, but they live for like 40 years, which is crazy. But they're another example of like a, an organism where if you see it, like how, how confident would you be that the aging in that organism is representative of like aging in a regular mouse or a regular mouse is representative of aging in that organism? And so my question is, can we take everything that we found and just look into humans? Like, how can we just correlate? Do these things actually happen in humans? And so one question is, what happens with the human brain as we age? Like, do we accumulate those amyloid beta plaques just as a normal part of aging that I showed you with that show that show up in Alzheimer's disease do they just come along and then eventually they cause a problem or is there another process that's happening or is it something that's like very specific to this Alzheimer's disease pathology and so what I've done is I've like sourced post-mortem brain um, samples from women ranging from 20 years old all the way up to 89 years old and I'm simply looking for the presence of these aggregated proteins 
And the really radical finding that I've had so far is that these aggregated proteins, they're, they're there when we're in our 20s. So that it might be that they're actually not directly associated in that way with like a negative outcome. There might be an, another step that's needed to get to the disease. So, I mean, that's, the disease, that's something I'm particularly interested in because I think it's really getting at human aging. Maybe we're special in some way, you know. What's your opinion of the powdered protein products that are being sold at Costco and everywhere else? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think I, I think there's definitely so the, so something I did want to mention. I, I should have had a slide on this as a caveat about diets. Is that obviously in like Ikaria and Sardinia, these other places that are the blue zones, they have a low animal protein diet. So the protein that they get from their diet comes from beans and legumes and you know these other things. But they do eat fish, etc. And it's, it's remarkable because the people there, they'll live to being in their 90s or even 100 plus, and they're very, very healthy. But one thing we know is that if you don't eat enough protein with aging, the muscles will, will tend to waste. Um, and obviously, if you do exercise, then you'll be able to you know, limit that process. But certainly, the, the amount of protein in your diet is a direct correlate with the level of sarcopenia, like the muscle wasting. And so if... Obviously, I would always recommend that if people can just have a, a whole foods diet, you know, where they're eating like fish and whatever, that's better than, than having a protein shake, let's say. But if you're, you know, if you're working out and you're finding it hard to get the protein from your diet, you know, if you're a vegetarian or something, then I, I don't see anything wrong with that. I think that actually there's probably some benefit to aging in humans because you keep the muscles stronger. And one related thing to that actually is this idea of using uh, creatine. So you might have heard of creatine powder. Now, creatine is interesting because it's used primarily by bodybuilders and people who want to improve their uh, muscle gains in the gym. But there's some recent evidence that suggests that people who take creatine are somewhat protected from um, declining cognitive function. And obviously, that could be a false correlation. It could be that they're the ones who are working out harder, and that's how you see that. But it's certainly very interesting that creatine might actually have like a broader sort of like anti-aging function. So that's one to keep an eye on. Yeah. In our last question today, you want to ask it? You ask it. Well, we were wondering, wondering about the insulin um, uh, reaction. Do, does that mean fruits and sweet vegetables, say carrots, beets? Increase, are, in, increase insulin? Yeah. Yeah. Are they detrimental? Boy, I can't handle this. <laughs> are yeah. they detrimental for us? Yeah, that's a good question, right? So, uh, probably the way that I'll go about answering that is um, I, I think obviously it depends on your own biology, right? So you probably have, it depends on your microbiome, it, but it tends, depends on like how you eat it. You know, if you're juicing your vegetables, you're probably getting more sugar from the vegetables than you would if you were eating them like raw. So uh, the, the, it seems to be the case that the, the fiber, you know, the cell walls and everything that you eat, it has to kind of come all together. So I think the level of processing of the food probably dictates the amount of sugar that you get from it. And there is one concept I didn't mention here uh, before. So there's this idea of glucose peaks being important. So as, as when you eat carbohydrates in your diet, obviously the, the levels of glucose will increase in the blood. And it seems to be important that the increase isn't too sharp. So there's an association between sharp increases in glucose level in the blood and the presence of something we call advanced glycation end products, which are known to drive aging. So it's an association. We don't exactly know if it's uh, going to lead to anything, but that the peaks seem to be associated with something that's toxic. So really, if you can, it might not be so much about having any increase in glucose because, you know, that's just normal. We're built to do that, but rather the, the speed. And so if you're eating them, like I said, juicing, you're going to be spiking the blood sugar rather, as opposed to just steadily increasing it. Yeah. So uh, one like anecdotal thing that came from actually the, the, the CEO of the book, he contacted a company and he was like, you know, when you're the CEO of a big company, you get paid the most, but you get everything for free. It's a complete joke. He contacted the company and he's like, I want to try your product. It's a glucose monitor, continuous glucose monitor. They're like, oh, you're from the book. That's great. You can advertise us. So they just gave it to him for free. It's like hundreds of dollars normally. And uh, I wanted to get one. They wouldn't give it to me. Um, so 
the, you wear the CGM, continuous glucose monitor, and it's great because you can wear it for a couple of weeks, have your normal diet, and you can see which things spike the blood glucose. And obviously, this is his biology, so you've just got to take it N of 1 today. But he was telling me that when he pairs uh, carbohydrates, specifically like white carbohydrates, like white bread, which obviously would normally increase the glu blood glucose sharply um, with a fat, so olive oil spread on the bread, that kind of idea, or like... Um, Having a, having a Thai curry, obviously you have the coconut milk mixed with the, the the white rice. And he said that having them separately, you'd get the spike, but pairing them together, it would completely blunt that effect. So maybe it's about the pairing. I would recommend if you, you know, if you have a con continuous glucose monitor, if you have access to that, if, you're, if your physician would, would be willing to try you out with that, I think it's a super powerful way that you can get control over your, um, your metabolism. Because everyone's different, you know, your diet's different, the way you cook food's different. So, yeah. I want to thank you, Edward, for a great presentation. You always thank bring you. it to us. That was really fun. I want to remind you to turn your phones back on or turn it, turn your volume back on. We want to see you next week for Rumi's uh, caravan. It's going to be fantastic. And we expect to see every single one of you at the fitness club from now on. Okay? Talk to you later. Thanks. See you next week.